welcome to Heartland for Children's Let's Talk About It podcast, where we provide education and resources for family matters in Polk, Highlands, and Hardy counties. We're so glad that you've joined us. So now, let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back. We have a very, very special episode today on Heartland for Children's Let's Talk About It podcast. I am here with the one and only Emma Bella and Amanda Bryant. And um, Emma Bella was just um, crowned as Miss Florida Hometown USA teen. So she's going to speak to us about that experience as well as her experience in foster care and then being adopted. And then Amanda's going to speak to us a little bit about her lived experience and also being an adoptive mom. So we're super excited to have them here and ready for this interview to get started. Are you ready, Emma Bella? Yes, ma'am. All right. Emma Bella. I love your name, first of all. It's Thank so pretty. Um, what grade are you in? I'm in eighth grade, about to be in ninth. Eighth grade, about to. Are you excited about going yes. to high school? I'm really excited because I want to do the cheer team. Fun. What else are you interested in doing? I'm also interested in going to the same school as my sibling. Mm-hmm. So me and him can help each other with things that I'm difficult in math, and he's really good at it. And he's diff his difficulties in reading, Mm -hmm. and I can help him with that. So that would be really fun. Teamwork makes a dream work. And if you could do it with your sibling, that makes it even more fun. So that's really cool. What else do you like to do for fun? I really like going to my friend's house. She has 17 horses. And almost every Sunday, we get to ride horses together. And it's really fun. fun. That is really cool. So you like animals? Yes, I love animals. You love animals? Okay. What do you want to be when you grow up? When I grow up, I want to be a child life specialist because during my journey, child life specialists were there every step of the way. Okay. And they always made me feel comfort in difficult situations. Okay. So, Emma Bella, you want to be a child life specialist when you grow up. That is very interesting. I've never heard about that. What do you do? A child life specialist helps kids who don't have a voice have a voice. And in hospitals, if a kid doesn't know what procedure they're going in, or what shots they're gonna get, they're gonna explain it, maybe give them a couple of sensory toys and calm them down a bit. Oh, I feel like you'll be perfect for this job. That is awesome. So, Emma Bella, Miss Florida Hometown USA Teen, I wanna start from the beginning and just kinda get a better understanding of your journey and kinda some of the things that you've been through. So tell us a little bit about you and how you got, went through the foster care system and then eventually adoption. For the first two years of my life, I was in and out of hard times in domestic violence shelters. And my mom, she struggled with drug abuse and alcoholism. The first four years of my life, it was just me and my biological mom. Okay. And we, she was going through a lot of domestic violence by my biological father. So soon we went into a domestic violence shelter and homeless shelters a lot. So having separation from my biological father, she ended up meeting her new boyfriend. Okay. They had a kid, which is my little brother Easton, and she still st- struggled with hard drug abuse and alcoholism, but even worse. And soon, C- Child Protective Services came into me and Easton's life, and her, Easton's fa- biological father is actually her brother, so oh. she ended up meeting us, and she had already adopted my two older brothers a couple years before, and soon she ended up foster caring us, and it was really difficult at the time. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you have a lot of uh, very important lived experience, um, and how old are you again? I just turned 14 in February. Just turned 14, and you're so articulate about just understanding your past. Tell me a little bit about how it shapes you now as a teenager. How it shapes me is I know how it is to be the underdog, and whenever I meet people, as I just went to private school, I just started going to school after seven years of being homeschooled. So... I know what it is like to be the underdog. So I have a lot of friends at my school. My best friend, he suffers from cerebral palsy, mm-hmm. and he has his hands are paralyzed, his legs are paralyzed. But me and him are best friends, 
and I hang out with him and I help him whenever he's writing or in projects. So I think how my life has shaped or how my um, childhood has shaped me is to be the person who doesn't want to stand out but wants to help other people stand out. Oh wow, you have a heart for giving and I love that about you, Emma Bella. Um, so what are some of the most significant challenges you faced during your time in foster care? The most significant challenges was seeing where I belonged. As she had adopted my two older brothers and her kids, they were basically like twins, both of my brother and her oldest son were the same age, oh. and her second or her youngest son and my youngest brother were the same age. So seeing where I belonged in the seven, no, six boys was really hard. I was gonna ask you, are you the only girl in the household? Yes. Other for mom? Wow, that's really awesome. So it does sound like that could be a challenge in any household, right? Trying to fit in as the only girl. But tell me about some of the highlights of being in foster care. Definitely some of the highlights is all of us being really hyper. Kind of sucks for her. <laughs> but we were always, we lived like with a really big pasture and we'd always just go explore out there. And they would always let me do what they were doing. Like if they wanted to work on a bike, they would teach me how to do that. Or if they wanted to build a treehouse, they would teach me how to use tools and they would let me help. Awesome. Would you say that being able to be around your siblings was also a highlight for you? Yes. Yeah. Actually, the fact, fun fact is I didn't know they were my actual brothers until a couple years after I heard them say that we were like biologically related, but I never thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. So I actually didn't know they were my siblings. You just bonded. Y'all just had a significant and special bond. She couldn't tell the difference between who was biological, who wasn't. They are to her, they're all her brothers, all, mm. all at once. And I always called her mom because she would always stop by the house because that was where her mom lived, mm -hmm. and she'd always visit. And I would always try to go home with her, and I had a really bad problem about calling everybody mom I met. Mm -hmm. So I'd always call her mom, and her husband. I'd call him dad, like even oh. before I even knew they were going to be my foster parents. How funny is that? So it sounds like you guys have just had an immediate bond. You, mm -hmm. your brothers, and your adopted mom and dad. It was meant to be. Yes. All right. So um, what inspired you to complete the Miss Florida Hometown USA teen pageant? What inspires me is Miss Linda. She does a lot of volunteering and a lot of community service with the girls. And it's such an honor to be one of the Miss Hometown girls because I've made so much progress that I probably would not have made with any other title. Okay, awesome. Tell us, who is Miss Linda? Miss Linda's the director. She's been doing it for, she made the pageant in 1986, the same year my mom was born. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, she's always made it where it's an honor to be. She's such a well-known lady. I've actually had so much letters sent in from, like, I can't remember who they are right now, but... <laughs> state officials. State mm -hmm. officials. Oh, wow. And she was actually congratulated on, on the, the Senate state. floor by the state senator. Wow. How long ago was the pageant? November, I think. Of last year. Okay. And so tell me a little bit about being in the pageant world. Do you think it's helped build your confidence? Definitely. I've been able to find where I belong as... Whenever I was younger, I always did all the sports my brothers did, football, basketball. I tried everything they did. But whenever Corona started, we had the opportunity to do a scholarship pageant. It was a really weird experience, but I've grown to love it. Wow. And I've been able to find like my confidence, my own voice, and a bunch of other things. Wow. Mom, have you seen a change in her? I definitely have. Um, it's just coming into her own and owning her story and giving back and seeing that the, there's just a bigger world. Wow. That's awesome to hear. So in what ways, I know Mom said that you're sharing your story, but what ways has your experience helped you to be able to give back? Definitely from knowing why they need it. Whenever you're going to a domestic violence shelter, you don't have time to pack everything you need. So I make comfort bags for people who are going to domestic violence shelters so they can have maybe a fuzzy pair of socks, soap, razors, 
and anything that they need that they were able to bring. Wow, that's so thoughtful because you're right. Sometimes you have to leave very quickly and you're not able to get those essential things that you need. And so you make these comfort bags and then you distribute it at different shelters? or Yes. I actually started with the Alpha House of Tampa because I found my old like book from whenever I was there and I was actually a poster card job. So that's how I was able to find out where the first shelter I was at. So I started making care bags, which at that time it was called Bella's Beauties. But then I realized if I made a 501, I'd have to change name. So I made Returning Hope to be my service project now. And I've been able to deliver to hospitals, shelters, and a lot of other places. That is amazing. So Returning Hope, what made you go with that name? It just kind of like spawned on me. It was like one of those like epiphanies. Mm -hmm. But it was like really thought of, and I've tried a bunch of other names, but none of them stuck. But returning hope, I like to return hope to other people's lives. I love that concept because one thing that everyone needs is hope <coughs> and the ability to say Sorry. that, you know, tomorrow is another, another day if you just hold on to a little bit of hope. So that is really, really special. Um, what advice would you give to foster and adoptive families from your unique perspective? Um, as this, someone who's gone through the system? Some advice I would definitely give is to have, before you get them, don't make their room. Let them decide what's gonna be in there and what their comfort things are gonna be. Also, that you aren't too strict on them at first because they have a lot of triggers. And to give them a pair of headphones and even if you don't want them to have a phone, give them an MP3 player and let them have access to music because that's what I use whenever I like having anxiety attack. It Music really calms you. But for me, it was definitely always having art supplies and toys and them always just letting me go places with them and treating me just like their own kid. Mm -hmm. So I'd definitely say some advice is to get them something warm, fuzzy, or like a stuffed animal. I still have the stuffed animal that I got from I don't even know where I got it, but in I Heartland. Oh yeah, but I still have uh -huh. it, and it I sleep with it every night still, and I'm 14. Yeah, but I definitely say give them something warm and fuzzy they can call their own. Yeah, call their own. Yeah, I love that advice, and um, and st and that's something a memory that you hold on to, right? So, for a child who may be going into a foster home for the first time, or even going through the adoptive process right now. What advice would you give to that kid? Definitely don't be scared that it's going to be fine. And if you have siblings, maybe try to use your voice that you want to stay together. Mm. And for me, I didn't go into any other foster cares except her. But I would definitely say use your voice and don't be scared that it's going to work out in the end. I love to use the voice because so often sometimes people think that kids don't have a voice to use and if you learn how to self-advocate then it helps with that journey so that's wonderful advice. Let me see, Amanda, mm -hmm. can you share a little bit about, with us about kind of your lived experience and your journey into becoming a foster parent and then an yes. adoptive parent? Yes. Um, well, as a child our family had a lot of dysfunction. My, my immediate family, my mom and my dad, they struggled with um, alcoholism and just constant um, fighting. Well, see, my grandparents had set this system up of preventing us from going into foster care. So when things would get too bad, they would step in and they were elderly and they would, you know, they would t take me for a few weeks while they got their stuff together. Um, every time a new baby was born, I was brought back to care for that, that child. So, um, you know, a lot of back and forth and, and instability and just always yeah. taking care of somebody. I always had a baby on my hip it, oh, since I was young. I wouldn't know what to do without one on my hip. So, you know, when other people in school would say, I want to grow up and be a teacher, I want to grow up in this, I was always like held back because I just wanted to be a mom. I just mm -hmm. wanted to have a normal family. So when I was 18, you know, I got um, married pretty early on because of things were just taking a turn for the worst in my family. So my little sisters were at babies. Um, one was four and one was one. When I got married at 18 and my husband had a, a son from a previous marriage and we got, you know, we had a ready-made family from yeah. the get-go. 
So I think that just led me just to say yes. Um, you know, it kind of was just wired into me to put my needs aside for others. And that was just like, it was just so natural for me to do that. So that started, you know, um, so when a need would arise, I was the first one to say, I can do it. You know, there's, a, I can make it work. So that led me into, you know, adopting. We always talked about adoption. We thought it would be something far off. But my eldest child was born with cystic fibrosis. So I was already pregnant with number two before, when we kind of got that diagnosis. And we just knew we wasn't going to add any more natural children to our family. So um, it was just, it, it felt meant to be when the, uh, the call came and two boys needed a home. And that's where it started. Wow. So now you have a household full of boys mm -hmm. and one girl. One girl. And how is it going? Well, now, you know, we do have one girl, but there, I did, my younger sisters did live with us from um, time to time. They were not officially adopted. It was something that was kind of, it's just like the things that have been done in our family. Mm -hmm. This is the way we we're taught to do it. Yeah. And so, but they have, they were, they're a lot older. So they had already left the home and she is the only girl with six boys. So um, it is very busy it's keeping up with everyone's needs and um, just staying organized and just going off the cuff and just going with the flow of things yeah. is very important. So with your lived experience as a child mm -hmm. and your lived experience prior to being adopted, do you think that makes you guys have a strong connection? Yes, yes. absolutely. Because I, I, I kind of can see um, how important it is for her to have her own autonomy to speak her own truth and to I, i'm not about to try to change things so everything's perfect for her but i want her to know what's her work around how do we work around this when we have that issue and it's because i've always had to think things through and to try to prevent um you know sorry that's where i mess up yeah <laughs> prevent things from getting worse or yeah well, well just to be proactive and intentional with her as a parent, I just know um, what it feels like to be the girl. And in what house full of boys, they come to either and her dad is is is, is bad about this. Will come and say, "What's for dinner? What are you going to cook us? Because we're the only females <laughs> in the house." And uh, I've taught her for very early on to say, "No, that is not my job to feed you. You you can also make yourself a snack or a mm -hmm. sandwich." And um, you know, and just try to draw those, help her draw those boundaries that I was unable to draw. I'm still learning how to draw boundaries. Right. So um, that we, you know, let her believe the truth that she matters and that I matter. Because it's very hard. Um, men don't automatically are gifted with that mm -hmm. intuition that women matter. Yeah. You know, we don't get sick. We don't need yeah. our timeouts. Yeah. But. Well, I love that you guys are both learning yeah. from each other. And yeah. You're still learning so and still developing. Learning. Yeah. So it sounds like, Amanda, you've always had a heart forgiven and caring for others and making sure that everyone else was okay. What do you do for self-care? Um, <laughs> that is where I could give advice to what to do. Don't follow what I do. You know, I, I haven't been great with self-care, but as I age, I have less of a bandwidth for putting up with certain things. So I have learned to draw the boundary and say, I do need self-care. I have recently started EDMR therapy for PTSD. Hmm. Um, it, you know, chaos and dysfunction, when it happens in your very primitive and core memories, you expect it. It's very normal to you. When, when people say, well, you didn't experience that as a child, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't because it wasn't normal. So um, your threshold for chaos is, is you, there's no end to it. You can right. accept all kinds of, um, you know, chaos into your life. So really getting to reworking those memories with, with EDMR, has really helped me to rewrite the truth in, in those memories because each of them have developed me to be the caring and a big hearted person I am. But I'll be the first to admit it that there was times where I should have said no, where I said yes. Yeah. And, so, and making no a full sentence. Yes, exactly. And not needing to, to explain. explain why. So working through, you know, my PTSD diagnosis and, um, not making light of things that happened to me as a kid it's just because it makes it easier to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that happened to me that I, w that I would make as a joke. And, and also, you know, um, and, and oh, that, it's okay. But to, to that was telling everybody and myself to treat me less 
to, for me to be smaller so mm -hmm. they could be bigger. Mm -hmm. So that, and I think working through that has helped her and I could, I could, I could share my journey, trans, I'm fully transparent where I need to be. Mm -hmm. um, make sure there's no codependency. Yeah, we're really good friends, but also I'm her parent. That's right. right. So there is, there's a boundary. Sometimes I have to remind her where that line is. She's like, wait, you're being mean. And I'm like, no. I'm being a parent. I'm <laughs> being a parent because mm -hmm. we're really close because we connect on such a deep level. Yeah. So. Well, that's really great mm -hmm. that you are still getting the, the need services that you need to make mm -hmm. yourself a better person for yourself. Yes. Um, as you've gone through this journey, what other community resources have helped you with just being a better parent, a better person? Well, first of all, um, we were the only, my husband and I were the only um, couple in the adoption class that had our kids already. Oh. But I had read already because, you know, to be trauma informed and tried, mm -hmm. but I was learning off the cuff because we said yes after 48 hours. So we weren't officially a foster care parent until, you know, but we were, you know, we were learning as we went. Yeah. So when we went through that class, that the being trauma informed really helped open my eyes. And I'm always, I'm, a, I'm an information person, so I really like to know how the brain works. Why do we react the way we do? What, 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 what is the why? There's not always a why and why we do things. Sometimes it's just impulsive, but there's an underlying issue in learning about being trauma informed. Yeah. Has helped. Amanda, you sound like you're very self-aware, but you're mm -hmm. continuing to learn and jumping in with both legs into being an adoptive parent while already having the kids. Um, how was that journey for you? It was nothing that can be described. It was basic. They were there. I learned so much about myself and my art, my relationship, and um, really just learning to start with an open mind. Forget anything you knew about having kids and just to have, allow yourself grace and resets for each day. And also extending that same grace and, and lending your calm to your children. I mean, that really helped, but it, it didn't help from always doing things right. It helped from getting it wrong mm -hmm. and then realizing, hey, I got it wrong, but you can't beat yourself up about getting it wrong sometimes. Take that mistake and turn it into, I will do better next time. Absolutely. And I have to, I have to do it wrong so many times, and do and rewrite it by doing right to get it a habit formed. Yeah, it's not always a habit. We react so much every day out of like our lower thinking skills, mm -hmm. and we we have to learn how to bring it back. And like my kids say, I was like, some days we're just having a bad day. I was like, you know what? Let's reset. So it was definitely it made me a different, totally different person. And it wasn't, and it wasn't easy on. Um, physical health, mental health, all those things. Um, but to be where I am today, I, I know the journey was worth it. Absolutely. So as you're going through this journey, how important was it for you to have a community and support system, whether through the system, Heartland, or through like your own family and community supports? Well, what I would say is when you're beginning this journey, you got to be okay with not being popular and know that you're gonna lose some people along the way. Find that friend, that one person that you can call and dump on every once in a while, but be willing to let them dump on you because it's not fair, because sometimes it feels like it's a one-way street, but to be that friend that's not gonna judge you, and that friend that knows where you're coming from and that you don't have to explain too much what's going on, they already know. So find your person, and that's not your spouse, because y'all are both in it together, and sometimes you just need to vent mm -hmm. and that, that person and, and just asking for help. And you're in the community, there are resources there. And I was unaware of them until after I needed them. So, but now I know they're there. I can give that advice to people. And when we worked with our caseworkers and um, first with the Children's Home Society, you know, that social worker is your liaison. Oh. That is your family's advocate that person is there for a reason ask them for things don't try to do everything on your own so that that really helped me um just i like them coming into the home i like to ask their questions i like their validation and you know and and you know whatever points they may have and then taking the classes taking advantage of the classes. i told my husband more than once we may not adopt adding more kids to our family but i would love to go through the class again just because Learn so much. It's learned so much, and and you could there's something you could take away with because we live in a broken world, and everyone has some level of brokenness. Right. 
So we, you know, um, being able to just to give back into the community is something that she does and we do, we do it together. Um, now I let her take the reins of it, but I lay the seed there and see where she goes with it. But even for me just to give back to my community helps me to see that the world is bigger than my problems. Mm -hmm. And um, it, we, we may not be talented or athletic or super whatever, you know, but we all have the ability to be kind and give. Yeah, I so. love that. So you and your spouse decided mm -hmm. you wanted to adopt and, and grow your family. What advice would you give for families who, you know, um, maybe one spouse isn't as willing or... <laughs> he, he, believe me, he says it's the longest 48 hours he's ever had. <laughs> I'm very persuasive when I, when I want something. So for the boys, for instance, I just knew that, uh, for instance, they were, two of my boys were 11 days apart and two of the boys were gonna be 16 days apart. When that opportunity came to me, I'm like, this is meant to be. They're built-in twins. Yeah. So that was just like, for me, it was already, it was decision was made day one. For him, he needed the weekend. I gave mm -hmm. him the weekend and I made him meet with our pastor and I forced it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but my husband is a good, a good trooper for putting up with my shenanigans because I'm always changing something in our mm -hmm. plan. So, you know, I, for, sorry, Compromise. what was the question again? It was just like, my brain went, Ugh. those fam the, like one parent wants to the other yeah. one. Oh yeah, yeah. So he wasn't always on board. He thought it would be temporary. I already knew by watching biological, she hadn't had the boys. The boys have been seven different placements. Mm -hmm. She hadn't had the boys since they were infants, but she completed the case plan for Bella. And because she had done that, they couldn't find another placement for the boys. So they were willing to let her have them back and work with her in the home and reunify. So it was kind of like, but her situation still wasn't better. They were just looking to see if she could. Mm -hmm. So that's how I found out about the boys. And my husband wasn't, he thought it would be temporary and that she would work on her plan. But I knew she was struggling already. I, ju I, I just met her mm -hmm. um, a month ago um, before this happened. And so when, you know, he wasn't quite on board, but what I would say is be patient, a lot hear them out, mm -hmm. especially it's usually, I wouldn't say usually, but a lot of the times it can be the mom wanting more kids and the father being logical, well, how are we going to pay for this? Right, right. Um, my husband's very logical. Well, can we, we can't, we can't, you know, we already have a big family. How are we going to afford this? Um, and I'm like, well, we, they share. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have boys. I mean, they, they're all the same age, same clothes and all that. And so me, I was just like going for my heart and he was more logical. Let them work through their process, whatever it may be. They need to work through their list and don't always be there to say what, but we can do this, but we can do that. They'll come to the realization and hear them out. Um, because you're going to need that support because if it's one-sided and things start to get difficult, there's going to be some blame and you know, you got to be stronger, strong enough for that to get when it gets to that point and be a strong unit a unit. Yes, yeah. exactly. So let me ask you, um, how do you, cause you guys a house full of kids. Mm -hmm. How do you and your spouse connect outside of the kids? <laughs> We'll see, you know, because we have kids with special um, needs and some medical diagnosis, as well as my husband is had a brain tumor um, just after we adopted. Wow. So um, I'm the, I was a primary caregiver and, and, and doing all those things. And I've, you know, had my own health issues over the years, but I, I've learned to help divide and conquer. And we're so used to that. Like, you go do this, you go do that, and then we're going to do this. And we're, sometimes we're just both concurrently on something for the family. So, you know, just find the small bits of time that you can shave out. Um, for me, it's about being intentional. Um, you may not have time to sit down and go to dinner, but you can send a text message. You can make a phone call and say, how was your day? Um, try not to let that be your time to say, well, can you believe our kid did this again and this again and this again? Are you going to do something about it? You know, try to just hear them about what they're doing as a stay-at-home mom for me. I, I need to hear, out, he needs to tell me about his day at work and I may be zoning completely out, but I try to ask him questions and make him feel like that part of his life is important and it's not all about the kids. And um, we should carve more time out for date night. It, date night is not going to the grocery store. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, doing those things, but for him and I, we're, we're a couple who work, so projects, mm -hmm. so. We well, do a lot of projects together. I love that that advice because we know we have a lot of families mm -hmm. and parents who may be going through those same challenges mm -hmm. and may be wondering how to keep that connection going. So I love that you're saying to be intentional and find that time mm -hmm. to even just connect 
even if it's via text. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that. So can you share a moment or experience since adopting that's been particularly meaningful for you um, in transforming kind of who you are as a parent and a, as a person? Since we adopted, um, there's been many moments that have been transformative, um, but I would say seeing it come from full circle. You know, um, like she had mentioned before, she couldn't tell who was her brothers and who wasn't her brothers because we are, they are all already so bonded. Um, but knowing that the full, they, they could stay together, that they have the opportunity. They had never been in a home to get under one roof together ever. And they, in that first Christmas, we, had, it, we only had it heard for 10 days. And I just remember, I said, I need to snap a picture of the, these four together because this is the first time that they are together. And to me, I was very close with my siblings. So I couldn't imagine being apart. And, you know, just seeing them grow together and, and knowing that they're going to have the opportunity to know each other. And, um, you know, just that full circle moment of knowing that um, it, it's not always rewarding and you don't always get that gratification. And you're not in, if you're not in it for the trophies, but you, that you're in it to do what's right and to be kind and to teach these kids. And you're investing in them being decent human beings. So I, I think, you know, that and then seeing my own biological children, they have never once felt left out or like there was a difference this was normal for them and they they, they are just as bonded I mean with each other a, as ever they're going to be there for each other okay. even long after me and my husband are gone we have bonded these uh, these humans together for life that they will always have their support system I mean she's got six brothers to call if she has a flat tire yeah and six brothers to know when a, a guy, guy broke his heart and um, blessed his heart for yeah. what's going to happen there but well i can't wait for prom to come around oh, yes. yeah <laughs> and i was going to ask you that about your biological kids and kind of how they yeah. kind of integrated into it so it sounds great it's great to hear that you know it's mm -hmm. been a, a smooth transition for them um but with a household full of six kids how do you make time for each individual child okay so when as we were at the great advice that we got in the beginning um was to take time in each and do time in with each child um, so I there's never a consequence in our house it, very rarely will you be out of fellowship with us as parents so what what I would do is like okay I'm not gonna ask my child to do a chore that I'm not willing to do alongside them if I have the ability and the time to do so so or if I'm if I'm making dinner someone's gonna be in there doing it with me and it's going to be time well spent working together alongside each other you learn so much about each other and you connect and i believe really hands-on and you in, in the things that you're talking about and teaching that child they're more likely to retain that if their hands are busy mm -hmm. and um and not allowing you know them to, to check out i call i tell my teenagers ghosting out mm -hmm. um and now that they're older it's difficult because mm -hmm. they want to ghost out on us they want to go to the room they want to you know um do whatever and i'm you know and i'm 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 knocking on that door and saying you know what I need your help with you raking the yard. We're gonna go rake the yard together. And, you know, in teaching them those things. And my husband's really great about that as, as well. It's not always a fancy, I mean, we do do Valentine's Day, our tradition, what is it, fries before? Fries before guys. Yeah, <laughs> fries before guys. So um, I'm not a big fan of holidays. I don't know why, uh, as a parent who's had trauma from childhood, I, I never enjoy a holiday. But I like to make my own rituals and traditions and do it out, off, off the box. So, you know, for her, for Valentine's Day, I don't want to date for my husband. I don't want expectations that are, could be broken. So her and I would do fries for guys. We just go get milkshakes. And, and that's something we do and she expects it. So, so you know, and my other, you know, my boys, you know, um, they just, they need intention. And that's what we, we do. And my husband's really great about that as well. Um, he's, he's more, he makes it more fun though. He's uh, the Disney dad and I'm the da mom that's staying home. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we'll take them to Disney. It sounds like you guys have created your own traditions and your own yeah. things within your family unit um, to create life exp um, memories. So that's wonderful to hear. Um, you know, right now we're in dire need of quality foster mm -hmm. homes. What what would you say to someone who may be contemplating whether to be a foster parent or even an adoptive parent? Um, how would you encourage them to participate in this journey? I think when most people are considering this, um, and I'm not here to beautify it. I, this is an Instagram worthy, um, I, I'm not going to inspire you. I'm going to ask you these things. I want to ask you to do your homework. 
to to forget anything, any preconceptions or anything that you've learned or heard about foster care or children who've experienced broken attachments or trauma. I want you to forget anything. I'll, and I want you to start with an open mind and, you know, um, work through and do a thought audit. Why am I doing this? You know, what, what, what do I expect out of it? Um, if you're, you're in it for the right reasons, you'll know when you work through this, it, you know, if, if there, and no one knew what I was doing and it wasn't, and I wasn't doing it for people to say, oh, look at that big family. They're all beautiful. They're matching outfits and they're going, you know, and doing these photo shoots and it's amazing. And then there's all this, um, well, they're, they're, you know, I, I never really like to get a lot of praise for it because it's like you, because you're doing it for these kids and they're, and you're doing it for, not for clout. And you're, you, you put the homework in, you learn what you can about how brains work. Um, watch people after you're trauma informed and say, I bet, you know, um, that homeless person, he's probably experienced some broken level of brokenness. L let me come from a place of understanding and not judging and in being a good listener and doing those things. And it's not about the money or, you know, for, uh, for us, we weren't foster care parents. We didn't do it. We didn't get paid. It was, it was, we funded ourselves mm -hmm. and with the kids needs. So, I mean, you couldn't say we did it for the money, but if you're, if you're, you don't do it for the money. You don't do it for the praise. Um, are you willing to not be popular with your friends? Are you willing to um, meet new people who can walk alongside you and say, you know, I wouldn't have met th this family or this person if I wasn't, you know, foster care. And they were able to add in what was important, you know, what I needed to know. And that's how I got from my, my information. And you're willing to learn. It, and you don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a beautiful house. You don't have to have everything together because Lord knows we didn't have it all together. But what we did have is adaptability to be able to accept what is, to be able to work through and, and, and emotionally regulate and know when to say, hey, you know what? I need to back off. And learning how to see you, how you react in stress. Um, do I react and do I escalate? Or can I come from a place of escalation to calm? Not everyone is set up to do that. And it's very important to be able to do that because you are going to go be triggered. I mean, these kids, they're working through big emotions and we're just kids in adult bodies. Uh, we don't, no one ever feels like they're just an adult and they got it all together. Mm -hmm. No, we all feel like we're faking it until we're making it. Yeah. We're really still like 15 messing up, you know, yeah. but just being able to just be transparent with yourself, be truthful with yourself for what your intentions are. I think you'll come from a place where you're ready and to open up your home and Sometimes you have to have bunk beds. Sometimes you can't have an aesthetically pleasing home, and that's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. Um, clean out the junk yeah. in your life, yeah. metaphorically and physically, before you add these kids, and just realize, I got room. If I can add another level to that bunk bed, I got room. Um, they don't all have to have, like, big, huge toy boxes and everything they wanted. You know, it's not all about that. Um, don't let those things hold you back. The only thing that should hold you back is how you react to stress. Maybe it's not... I can't do it right now. I need to work through this before I can add them in and making sure your relationship's ready. If, if you're in a relationship, if you're single, you know, making sure that you have the time away from work to, you know, to step away and help that child adjust. I love it. That's, so. that's great, great advice for anybody who's contemplating mm -hmm. being a foster parent or adoptive parent. Mm -hmm. And so, so Emma Bella and Amanda, mm -hmm. sounds like y'all have a very special bond. Talk to mom directly and just tell her how um, it makes it feel for you to be a part of her life. And then, Amanda, I'm going to ask you to do the same for Emma Bella. It makes me feel really special because you chose me out of, you could have chose any other kid, but you chose me. And you gave me a home and a safe place to live. So it makes me feel really important and special. Mm -hmm. yeah, Amanda? I can cry. I was trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, it, it. You make it worth it. Y yeah, you do. You're you're like the cherry on top to everything. You kind of just. Um, there's not always a lot of rewards, but having you <sighs> as my daughter has given me something to look forward to. I look forward to you growing up and us being true best friends. And I look forward to you sharing things with me about crushes and things like that, because you know that I love you and that we can have that relationship of no judgment. 
And I love watching your successes and the way you project yourself and on stage and how graceful and genuine you are because you are the best Imabella that Imabella can be and you know that. And you you just make it you just make it worth it. Just being your your buddy and your thrift store pal and uh, your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, you know you're amazing. Yeah. You're already full of yourself. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Well that's a beautiful mm-hmm. ending for this um podcast. And, you know, we all need, uh, they say blood is thicker than water, but we all need water to survive. And that's what adoption is about. Sometimes you connect with people who just make you better and give you the nurturement that you need to make it through another day. So I want to thank Amabella, Miss Florida Hometown USA teen, and then her beautiful and amazing mom, Amanda, for being our guest today. Um, your bond and your story and your willingness to help others, that both of you, is just inspiring and amazing. And I thank y'all for being here today. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Heartland for Children's Let's Talk About It podcast. There is a great need for foster families who are willing to open their hearts and homes to teens, sibling groups, and children with special needs. To learn more, check out the description for resources or visit heartlandforchildren.org.